Alors, euh, commençons d'abord par un temps de présentation euh, un petit peu conséquent. Euh, donc, on était parti plutôt sur 10 minutes. Euh, je vais euh, donc donner la parole d'abord à ma voisine de gauche, Rémoël, qui est déléguée générale d'Erasmap. Donc, euh, je vais euh, te laisser présenter l'association et euh, le projet qui anime, euh, qui anime Erasmap. Thank you very much. So Thank you for inviting me here and thank you, thank you to the audience for coming. I will give a brief presentation on Harassmap and... Uh, oh, uh, is it now on? <laughs> okay. um, so I'll give you a brief presentation on Harassmap first and then I'll answer any questions. So basically we started in 2010 and although we're called Harassmap, our work is, we do a lot of work offline. And our main strength basically is linking the offline work with the online work. So I wanted to have the website on, but uh, I didn't have time to tell, um, to tell them to put it on. But basically our uh, crowdsourcing website is um, a map and people are, they go on the map and they report harassment and it looks like a, a red dot on the map in the place that it happened and then they tell us a little bit about the incident that happened. So the time, the place, whether they've actually uh, experienced harassment or they've witnessed harassment and what kind of harassment it was, etc. So this is basically where the name Harassmap came from. In 2010 when Harassmap started, Egypt was still a society in denial of the size and magnitude of the problem of harassment. We, women would get harassed predominantly, but men also get harassed, but predominantly women would get harassed in the street all the time. But at the same time, they would hear from people, from the society that harassment doesn't exist. So when Harassmap started, it started as a, an outreach program to encourage bystanders to intervene when they see harassment so that we can end social acceptability of harassment. And then we found out about Yu Shahidi uh, software program which uh, crowdsources information and we started the map. So at this time, in this social and political circumstances, this, um, this platform was very much needed in society because women were looking for a way to express the, the kind of harassment that they experience every day, but at the same time that society tells them does not exist. So we actually needed that to, to visually show how bad the problem is. And it was very popular and we, at that point, we got a lot of, um, we got a lot of reports, but at the same time, we were doing our offline work where we would have groups of volunteers going out in the streets to encourage bystanders to intervene when they see sexual harassment so that we can end social acceptability of sexual harassment. And the reason why this was our mission is because even when people witnessed harassment, they, wouldn't, they would be very passive. They wouldn't intervene at all. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief um, overview of the um, of our online presence and also more importantly the link between the online and offline um, we use we use the information the crowdsourced information for various uh, purposes and one of them is research so we kind of monitor the trends of harassment what times uh, do they usually happen um, not places exactly but uh, social spaces basically so for example from the online reports and also the reports that come through Facebook and uh, Twitter that we put on the map, we learned that um, uh, against uh, the, the popular uh, stereotype that harassment happens at night when women are walking alone, it actually happens during midday and in the most um, crowded streets in, in Cairo. Uh, more harassment happens in shopping streets rather than residential areas. More harassment happens in front of girls' schools as they're coming out. So we use it to monitor trends rather than specify a specific place or street. 
So we also use it to um, take the data and analyze it and um, regenerate it into campaigns. So these campaigns would, um, would answer stereotypes that are used constantly to excuse harassment and to, uh, to also engage with the public. So some of our campaigns include the stereotypes that we usually use and um, that are very much reflected in the reports that we get. So for example, very, very uh, common stereotype all over the world is the um, women's attire and women's clothes when they get harassed. So because we get reports from like fully covered women, including the face, who get harassed, then we, we can say like, okay, but we get reports from women who are covered. Um, and then, of course, with all the other uh, excuses like uh, late marriage, sexual frustration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we do that, and actually, um, these campaigns are are disseminated offline, but also online. And this is where, um, relating to our previous panel, there is a lot of discussion over Facebook, for example, and Twitter about these issues. So we still get people saying like the general public would comment on our posts and then we we would engage in a conversation basically it's um it's a very interactive um, process and then we um we also we okay so these are mainly the uses of the of the online offline and um and then i wanted to move on to um how it is today, like uh, previously, as I said, it was popular because it was an anonymous um, anonymous platform that provided space for people to speak without like being stigmatized. Um, right now, it's, it's still, it's way more accepted. It's still a bit unaccepted, but it's way more recognized as a problem in Egypt. So um, we get a lot more on anonymous reports. So from Facebook, for example, a lot of women find it empowering to actually report harassment through their own profiles and even take a picture of the harasser and, you know, and, and kind of find it um, empowering that um, they are shifting the, the stigma from the harassed to the harasser. And this shift um, is, is very powerful, not only online, but offline. Again, linking both. So, a lot of women would proudly like um, post on Facebook that they've taken the harasser to the to the police station, and you know, uh, no matter what the consequences are of the events that happen in the police station, just this action of taking him there kind of shifts the um, the, pa the gender power balance between the two. So right now we've we're finding way more activism on online. Um, not necessarily anonymous to report harassment. However, the um, it's there's a resistance, like uh, like a lot of the previous speakers have spoken about um, finding this resistance movement to women speaking up online and offline, of course. But um, because online gives a lot more space to uh, for people to discuss, then we find a lot of um, kind of uh, counter not only groups, but posts, like um, individual uh, individuals posting uh, stuff, but also the creation of groups that are completely against the messaging that, w that we try to give. So even if, it's, even if it's still against sexual harassment, so for example, the, the messaging that we always try to give is sexual harassment is bad because, you know, it's, um, it's a violation of human rights, basically, and, um, and the whole gender power dynamic between men and women, public-private space. Um, then w a lot of the conversations that we have to engage with, uh, that we have to engage in with the public, don't necessarily have to say that sexual harassment is actually bad, but it's the way we actually formulate our message. So we'll get a lot of people saying, um, well, it's bad because, you know, um, you don't want it to happen to your sister. So this is really the, um, the messaging you're supposed to be using. Or somebody else would say, well, you know, uh, we've gotten actually, this was a real criticism. Um, y you shouldn't be saying this, you should be saying to people to go back to like religious beliefs and, you know, 
to if 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 they can just go back to the religious conviction uh, to the to the pure religious beliefs, we won't have a problem. You shouldn't really use it, be using this dialogue. You should be using the other one. Um, and we we kind of always try to to engage, um, and it it kind of brings up a dilemma all the time because um, it's really just. Um, the the messaging that uh, that the organization wants to take and as much as we try to not make it as if it's um it's a women's fight and we we're always always emphasizing that both men and women must intervene when they see sexual harassment and they must intervene in support of the harassed not the harasser which is also quite common um we still we still get these um ideology debates on what's the best kind of messaging to use to um, to fight sexual harassment. So I, I don't know how much time I have more. Three minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so also to speak about how uh, part of the resistance that I was speaking about, a little bit more about it, is um, how the existence of women online is actually taken against them. So sometimes the the fight or the resistance movement goes to to very dangerous extent basically. And we've had this um, we've had these situations most commonly in um, in other governorates than than Cairo or in mostly in in rural areas or governorates that are more conservative basically. And some of the things that we've seen is just just the fact that the woman actually has a Facebook profile or a Twitter account or something that's taken. And I'm talking about the specific incidents that we've um, one of our partners, uh, partner organizations, have been exposed to. Um, that they've taken the pictures of girls just because they have a profile picture and not like a flower or something. Because uh, in a lot of these areas, like the the girl would put. Um, profile picture that's not actually her face or but this organization the um, it's a feminist organization and they've put their profile pictures as their own faces and these were all collected and taken to a, a group to um, to create a scandal for them around the, the area and and they're known in the area and they've been uh, they've been upset about that but like it didn't stop their work but um, it was a great example of the kind of threat that's felt when such an organization is uh, when there's a when the, there's a threat to um, to the masculine dialogue of of society. Even if this threat is some people, some women having Facebook profiles and saying that harassment is bad, for example. So um, so yeah. To wrap up, basically. Um, this um, this dialogue and this dilemma exists both online and offline, and we always try to connect the two, and we always try to use the online sources, whether it's the um, whether it's the map, or it's the um, the Facebook and Twitter. We always try to use it uh, to collect information, but also to disseminate information. And um, yes, it's been successful so far, and in in terms of following the trends of sexual harassment and engaging with the public. Thank you very much, Rémi. Merci beaucoup. Euh, on reviendra sur la question de l'impact et justement étudier peut-être plus spécifiquement euh, comment en fait l'utilisation de la technologie a permis de légitimer le sujet et aussi de favoriser une prise de position politique, etc. Mais on y reviendra après. Euh, je vais donner d'abord la parole à Angela Vasco qui est artiste et activiste. Euh, nous vous avons euh, contacté car euh, nous avons été euh, passionnés par euh, votre expérience des jeux vidéo et euh, expérience des jeux vidéo que vous appréhendez comme joueuse, mais aussi comme chercheuse. Et donc, euh, on, va, on vous a demandé de bien vouloir nous présenter euh, votre expérience 
des jeux vidéo à travers de vos travaux sur euh, World of Warcraft, notamment. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, thanks. Thanks for bringing me um, to this event. Um, really interesting presentation so far, and I'm learning so much. So um, thanks again for having me. I'm Angela Washko. I'm a, a professor of electronic time-based art at Carnegie Mellon University um, in Pittsburgh, and also a research-based artist and DIY digital ethnographer making performances, videos, written works, and interventions, often within video game um, and internet enclave contexts. Um, the piece playing right now has nothing to do with what I'm going to present today, but um, I just really like showing that in the beginning. Uh, if you're interested, it's called Free Will Mode, and you can look it up, but it's relatively unrelated. Um, if I had more time, I would talk about my work um, operating in collectives um, and also my uh, writing um, and a practice of intervening on mainstream modes of receiving information, but um, I don't have time for that. So I'm going to talk about two research-based art projects primarily. Uh, the first one, which I believe is what I was invited for, is called the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness in World of Warcraft. So in 2012, my interest in online gaming, performance art, organizing, and collectivity sort of overlapped when I started this project. Um, is it playing? Great. So I've been playing World of Warcraft for nearly 10 years. Um, World of Warcraft is, if you don't know, a massively multiplayer role-playing game that has 8 million players worldwide. In 2012, I founded this council as a platform to discuss issues within the community's public communication channels, which had become quite misogynistic, homophobic, and racist on the servers that I played on and seemed to be not in any way in relationship to the, the design of the game itself. It was very informally um, constructed that way. So as the council, I asked questions about inclusivity, entitlement, um, who gets to ask questions about the community's actions, um, how players are held accountable for harassment and other forms of online abuse, uh, why women are treated so poorly in the space, and why the politics of everyday life end up so embedded in exchanges in this amazing fantasy landscape. So after years of playing the game properly, as the council, instead of exclusively continuing to follow the structure of the game, which wants you to get better equipment and kill more awesome dragons and all that stuff, I decided to start going into major towns in the game and asking players to discuss why the um, communities on the servers I played on had become so exclusionary toward women, non-heteronormative individuals, and racial minorities. Um, I also want to make it clear that the American... Oh, oh sorry. Wait, louder? Slower. Okay, sorry. Whew, sorry. Um, I'll try. <laughs> Um, I'm also trying to cram in so much stuff. Um, but I also want to make it clear that the American WoW context is most likely very different um, from the European WoW servers. I'm not really sure about that. So when I'm speaking about this project, I'm speaking from an American um, server perspective. I wouldn't claim to be universal on that. Um, here a player is telling me that she plays on a server in which women in her community are often harassed for sexual favors regularly. Um, which is a really common occurrence for women in the game. So this um, discussion forum later developed into a focus on asking players to share their understandings of what feminism means to them. I started focusing on this after it became apparent that feminism warranted the most extreme and polarizing responses of any topic that I could bring up in the space. At some point, I started capturing videos of these conversations, and I started an archive of them which to me, I think, create a geographically diverse picture of American opinions on feminism. How is that speed? Mm. Better? <laughs> um, some of the conversations, even really early on, um, really dove into delicate and intense subject matter, especially as the anonymity in the space allows for an intimacy and lack of physical world accountability. Um, unlike other parts of the web, like social media, WoW is still relatively avatar hidden, um, in which you don't have this kind of relationship back to your physical um, space persona. Uh, you can be Sna or Ooh Kitties or whatever. Um, so I initially went into the project with a plan to try to change the sexist and racist language used casually inside WoW by trying to bring together all of the other people who are frustrated with the discrimination in the space. Um, 
However, as I talked to more and more players about it, the reasoning for the existence of these issues became increasingly complex. And I realized that um, trying to change it in my own kind of image of what it should look like is not only unrealistic, but also somewhat colonial in its impulse. So my intention shifted away from changing it to rather un understanding it and trying to create safe spaces for sharing amongst other players and visibility around the issues, focusing on the player base itself. Um, a lot of the responses I got in the beginning involved um, players telling me to get back into the kitchen or make them a sandwich. This is a very popular way to speak about women in World of Warcraft and one of the many reasons I started the project in the first place. Um, here's a player telling me I need to make their sandwiches fa faster. Um, here's a player telling me, wow, you have a computer in your kitchen. Uh, here's a player telling me feminism can be defined as a woman going into the kitchen. We all know that's wrong. Um, and then get back to, or GB2 kitchen stands for get back to kitchen. Anyway, this gives you hopefully a sense of the social landscape in the game that I was operating in. Um, so one of the many subtopics in the project involved an investigation into why in more recent years, men have overwhelmingly started to play female avatars. Through these conversations, which I always disclose to participants will be presented elsewhere, I began to realize that most of the female avatars I was talking to are actually played by men. This hunch was backed by some census data from 2010, which stated that 55% of the female avatars running around in the game are actually played by men. Um, on the other hand, less than 1% of women cross over and play male avatars. So I thought that this was very interesting. Initially, I thought that this was exciting, this whole men playing women phenomenon. And I imagine that men were playing women because they wanted to have the perspective or the empathetic experience of learning what it's like to play WoW, preyed upon and perceived as a woman. I was very wrong. Avatar bodies are treated as abstracted objects of desire. Here somebody is telling me girl pandas turn him on. Um, if it's known that I'm a woman in this space, I'm automatically something to project male sexual fantasy and ownership onto. Women often accept this as their scarcity is also a benefit to them um, competitively in the game in terms of trading their femaleness for preferential treatment in guilds, gifts of gold, um, gifts of equipment, or just merely being able to continue to play the game that they love. With so many men playing female avatars, women actually have to come out as women to be identified as such. Um, so as the council, I started asking men why they play women, and I was surprised to find that this answer was pretty consistent. Because I'd rather look at a girl's butt than a guy's butt. Here's another person saying the same thing. And I have hundreds of screenshots um, with this very um, statement. So I started thinking about how this line of thinking could become so pervasive and how this became an informal rule across servers. Okay. Um, this became so popular across servers that many male players told me that they play women as a way to avoid a fear of being perceived as gay by other players. Um, here a player is actually shouting to the whole town, quite a large geographic area, um, that he's not gay, just to make it abundantly clear. As if that's, you know, anyway. Um, so the conversations have improved over the years. I've maintained the nu neutral stance of a researcher and have developed strategies for um, ignoring trolls. Um, the project has um, gained a pretty large following in-game and even an intentional inclusive guild was created as a part of these discussions on the primary server that I operate on. My biggest hope is that the project becomes a prototype for actions by others, and it has where other players have kind of taken on um, and started their own um, versions of the council on the different servers that they play on. In addition to, oh, that looks very dark. In addition to performing this intervention in the game space, I occasionally bring the process to live theater audiences 
In a recent iteration of the live performance in January in New York City, I recruited two other players to work with me in the game for a year, and then ultimately produced a live performance of our process, and I, as I narrated the conversations as they unfolded. We additionally collected definitions of feminism from audience members, so the audience members could contribute to the conversation as well, making it less voyeuristic um, than previous versions of the performance. And this voyeurism and exotic, sorry, exoticism of gamers is an aspect of the live performance that I'm working toward getting rid of, because I don't want the takeaway from the project to be necessarily that gamers are horrible people, but something much more um, complicated about the um, context of the game um, and player base itself. If you're interested in learning more about the project, um, I have quite a long essay and several video excerpts online. Mais je, je fais tout de suite la transition euh, avec euh, Souderad. Je fais partie des fondatrices du site Match Holland, euh, dans sa version française, puis dans sa déclinaison euh, iranienne, et puis euh, une, euh, une autre militante féministe turque pourra aussi parler euh, de sa dé déclinaison euh, turque. Donc je vais aussi te laisser la parole pour présenter le site, sa genèse et ensuite sa déclinaison. Merci. Bonsoir. Je vais par contre parler en anglais parce que je veux rester connectée avec euh, les autres intervenantes. Um, so I'm so very excited about all what you've just been presenting and I was just wondering about we all have the same problem all over the world actually. So it's a global um, problem we're facing and I can just ensure you that Harassment does exist in France a lot, you tell me, and not that many women have not ever experienced um, not being harassed at work, at school, wherever. I'm, I promise you there are also some people among us here who have been through this. Um, but the problem is always about um, raising the voice and talk about it because you don't want to be um, go on. I mean, you don't want to go under that chilling effect and just what we saw in the previous panel. So the idea of Macholand came came from actually um, some petitioners. I launched a petition for Malala mm, being candidate. Uh, I mean, French candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize two years ago. Not the the year she got it actually. And that was a huge, huge petition because people around the world got to it and they wanted really to do it. So those days, we didn't really think that she would actually one day have the Nobel Peace Prize, but we would just raise the awareness about um, what is happening around the world and how important it is to get people sensitive about uh, feminism, uh, girls' education, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this... Um, change.org platform in our hands and we used it and it was very, very fun, too much of fun, I would say. So we were just wondering if we could have a petition um, platform, like a feminist petition platform, but also cyber activism platform because they're younger and younger people coming and then we've got this new generations, new feminist generations and new generations who wanted to be feminist and we needed this. So this was the combination of the new tools we needed to use as uh, feminist survivors, and we needed also to teach people how to um, live actually in cyberspace. So in Iranian, we call this virtual world, and the real world, like where we are here, is the real world, and that is the virtual world. Um, so this was the idea of Matchaland. So Matchaland basically is a cyber activism platform only focused on feminism. So we're not doing, for now, anything on environment, political, or anything, anything really this is really feminist. Um, so today is the first birthday of Metroland.fr. So <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> to Metroland too. Um, I'm going to launch this video we met for um, Metroland Farsi, and then I'm going to ta talk about it later more. <laughs> Macho یا مچو با ریشه لاتین یعنی مرد سالار ماچولن یعنی سرزمین نابرابری جنسیتی ماچولن دنیای امروز ماست جایی که نه تنها جنسیت به دوتا یه زن و مرد کشیده Okay, so um, basically this is the first website ever in Farsi or Iranian um, 
based on cyber activism. We don't even have change.org because Iran is under sanctions, because we have the Islamic Republic of Iran, because feminism is condemned in Iran. So you cannot even talk about feminism. So this is how it looks like. We've got different um, actions. We've got Twitter actions. And you just need to click on one um, button to just automatically uh, tweet that tweet, which is hashtagged and also uh, with the at sign which is important for us, and then you've got the Facebook actions, and then we've got also the email actions. We also got petitions on it. But the most important thing is that this is kind of democratic um, platform. It means I am not in charge of creating different Vegas. We call actions in Farsi, we call them Vegas. But everyone can just come and suggest something. So there are three principal um, and basic parts in each action. This is what the truth is, so c'est quoi les faits. Uh, what we think of it, so we explain why we think this is sexist and we need to do something, and then what we are going to do. So this is basically what all naturalland.org sub websites, let's say, follow, and this is exactly the same uh, strategy we have. So um, what is also very important for us in Naturalland Farsi is the empowerment of everyone being able to raise the voice and being able to talk about what is sexist and what he or she or the person sees around um, in public spaces. So we are not intervening in um, private lives. So we're not for now, we're not really talking about domestic violences, but we're talking about TV shows, we're talking about the um, state's uh, laws, etc., etc. So um, let's talk a little bit about Iran and what, what we are talking about exactly. Um, so um, Iran is the... Um, uh, most connected country in Middle East after, guess where, Israel. Uh, so we've got 20 million of people, um, of netizens, who are using the internet, um, and the po total population is 80 million people. So one-fourth of people are connected to internet, but Iran is also one of the uh, 13 enemies of internet, um, in 2013, uh, that is the reporter on uh, Without Borders, who called Iran one of the biggest enemies of internet. That is because uh, more than 50 per 500 most opened websites in Iran is banned. YouTube, Facebook, Matchaland, they're all banned. So people, first thing about internet is how to open an email, and I can tell you many people call email the most secure one, um, IDs and etc. So go anonymously. So we have when they get to of um, changing also the face of feminists as bad angry feminists to say, hey, feminist is fun. You will never not be so much promoted in Iran or the like version or the sexist or not, but you can pass. But I think you already heard about um, the Iranian. That was a uh, husband thought she should have been inside the country, school, whatever. So some of the um, very interesting actions we had on in um, Sorry so much. <laughs> less than 24 hours we had outside the country to just abolish this not without asking the authorities but they never answered us so they tell they told us yes we got those emails um from Farsi we're not really Rosal uh, I mean object objective for the laws we're not really dealing and also to high, um, sorry, to um, raise that anymore. So um, this was one of the most important victories we had. Um, so I'm just, I think that is more important. We also have very severe security website. It got hacked and hacked, and then I just uh, let it go. But patients, I've been asked of every every person. So um, in Iran, there are loose stations which are like white chat rooms. It's not chat rooms, but they just see your your picture as a woman as you start. Sexual that was also very well um, welcomed actually in here, and um, by the way, we are also working on these are the sticker under any sex, nothing cyber um, harassment or uh, thank you. And this is not an, it's much easier for people to just send the stickers and just block before blocking that. in um, their cyber life. Those are um, the other keys we have, so that not every woman is in danger. And once women are in danger, and we have also our support an email or Facebook account or anything being hacked, there are also some support with us who is going to um, um, more The most important things I wanted to tell you, not do someone talking about natural land, no one would know about it, and no one could just click. And there is some people, so cyber activism cannot um, live without the risk.
that's it. Thank you.